I'm Stacy Grinsfelder. And I'm Daniel Hanter. And you're listening to True Tales from Old Houses, the mini Hey, Daniel. Hi, hi, hi. How are you? I'm good. And welcome back to everyone who's listening. Welcome to the mini The mini We had a fun mini a couple of weeks ago, I guess. I'm still getting used to this new schedule of ours, but we, where we did, we kind of circled back, as we called it, the circle back episode, following up on some things that we talked about before. And to some degree, we're continuing that today. And before we jump into that, I do want to say a thank you to our mini sponsors, The Window Course from Scott Seidler of The Craftsman Blog and Sutherland Wells. Thank you both. Yes, thank you to both of you. Appreciate it. I have a follow-up, an Ivy follow-up. Do you want that first? Should we start there? An Ivy-based follow-up, yes. Okay, so on one of the big episodes we lovingly refer to around here as the Maxisodes, <laughs> the Maxisodes, we, <laughs> we answered a question about Ivy during listener Q&A. I think we kind of landed on the fact that neither of us think it's a great idea to allow it to grow up the side of the building. But I got a great email that I thought was so important to share, and it comes from Mary. And Mary owns a plant landscape design business in Los Angeles, and she works mostly on century homes and other old houses. And she weighed in on another reason why it's not a great idea, and specifically why the homeowner during that listener Q&A was probably asked, or maybe one of the reasons, why she was asked to remove it from her brick building. And what Mary said is that although it is true that it can ruin the brick but, and pests and stuff like that, climbing plants can also create a fire ladder and that flames can spread from the ground to the roof and the treetops in seconds. And I did not even think about that whatsoever. Me neither. Didn't even cross my mind. I was kind of excited. I, ha- I hate to admit that. I was like, maybe... Maybe someone's going to come in with a pro IV stance and just shake it up. But yet another compelling reason. That's a, that, that's very good to note. Yes. Now, there's a little bit more in this email, and I think Mary could be an excellent resource for us on an upcoming episode about landscaping because she has all kinds of interesting ideas. And one of those was she works with landscaping on these houses because most people don't think about landscaping. They sort of treat it as an afterthought, but it mm-hmm. actually kind of really works in the big picture. And she said, like, for instance, trellising, if you have an appropriate native vine along a western facing wall, it actually can provide extra protection from intense summer heat and reduce cooling costs. I guess we all know trees and green spaces reduce the overall temperature. You and I have mentioned that before. We've talked about that just kind of in passing. But Mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't think about it from a homeowner's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Never once occurred to me. Very cool. Yeah, for sure. So she works with native plants there in California. And of course, there's the fire risk is, is huge there. Right. So thank you. Thank you, Mary, for sending that message. That was an excellent follow-up. And we're always open to that. I love hearing from, from listeners. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. Okay. So I want to ask you super quick. Okay. Just a cottage update. I even hesitate to ask. Oh, oh. Well, the update is pretty much no update. State of New York, so uh, things move slow. The two to three weeks that a title search was, you know, should definitely take, I don't know, I guess is taking six or whatever. So okay, I'm just kind of in a holding pattern. Um, I do still have some things I got to get out of the house, but otherwise pretty much just waiting on that. Like I said before, not not anticipating anything would be wrong, but... Uh, it takes as long as it takes, right? We just keep trucking, yeah. So eventually, we will get there. <laughs> Hopefully before I run out of money. <laughs> right. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all that's really kind of happening in that realm. Otherwise, I'm just kind of like doing weird stuff with my time, like cleaning my car really well and like ordering weird foaming products that are supposed to make the tire shiny. Didn't you just detail your truck? So are you just obsessed with detailing vehicles right now? I think I'm becoming like a auto hit. What's the, <laughs> I don't I know. I have the no right. idea. A motorhead or something? I'm so not part of this world that I don't even know what to call it. I don't, I hate this. So what happened was I basically 
let myself go on like a small journey into used cars and like what would it look like because my my regular quote-unquote nice car is now 10 years old my truck is almost 20 years old I'm like and and they you know are having associated issues like that happen when they get that old and so I sort of played with the notion of what if I got rid of both of these stupid cars and upgraded you know not to brand new but just just a little newer and then I got overwhelmed basically and decided that uh, this is not a good plan drive both of these things into the ground and see what happens but along with that I was like okay I think we should give them a little bit of attention so the truck I bought that thing two years ago from a teenager and then just proceeded to just never clean it or have it cleaned so that was a real experience and then I said I will never do that again. I think detailing a car is absolutely one of those things that is worth paying for. But the guy that used to detail cars down the street appears to have shut down. So I sucked it up and I'm doing the Subaru now. And it's even worse than the truck because it's a much bigger (laughs) interior space. And I don't understand why cars have so many nooks and crannies and little ridges. And just like, can we streamline this so it's easy to wipe down, please? So anyway... Then I killed the battery, leaving the doors open. It's just like, I can't win with these cars. I'm going to stick to houses. Anyway, (laughs) (laughs) speaking of, you just had a big annual event, the Window Workshop. The first weekend of the Window Workshop. The first weekend. Yes, the first weekend has come and gone. And let me tell you. I love teaching window restoration. I just, it's funny, you know, my heart is just so full. I know that sounds kind of dumb, but it's just being around these people who want to be there and want to learn window restoration. And I love their questions. And I like that things crop up, problems crop up, and we're problem solving together because that's really what it is. They're going to find their own problems with their own windows when they get home. And and just wonderful, wonderful crew. We had a small group this week of eight. The next group is 14, so almost double that. And Great, How great much time. fun did the weather cooperate? Oh my goodness, we had the best weather. So last year during the workshop, we the first day was very warm, very hot. This I recall. year, <laughs> yeah, you recall, you were there. We were all a sweaty mess. This year, the first day was nice and cool. That's the day when we're really outfitted in our PPE and we've got our you know respirators and gloves and eye protection and it's just hot, hot work. So it was very pleasant to get that done on that day. And then the next day was warmer, bordering on a little uncomfortable in the late afternoon, but because we weren't wearing all of that gear We were able to stay comfortable, you know, just drink a little extra water. And we work in the basement of Epworth Hall, which sounds terrible, but it's actually not because there's lots of windows. It's lots of light in the basement, but it does stay cool because it's halfway underground. Right, right, right. Okay, so that cooperate good. Did my boyfriend cooperate? (laughs) <laughs> yes, Brad gets an A+. Plus. He was an okay, excellent, good. excellent hospitality host. Last year, he was not very pleased with the food. And so he <laughs> went and sourced delicious food. I can't say enough. Okay. I don't know how he felt. Like, I am not a foodie. So in all honesty, whatever somebody hands me that I didn't have to make or find myself, I'm usually quite happy with it. But I thought it was delicious. So I, I figure if it's memorable enough to me, then then it must have been really good. But I think we got it from Butter Meat Company. Yeah. That's there in Perry. So yes, Brad did a great job. He was very helpful and friendly. And we had some some funny times on our excursion. So I got to go to Letchworth with uh, actually just one other person. And then everybody else went to the creamery. And then we oh, cool. met up at the local brewery and had a drink and recapped our experiences. Pretty funny stuff. How much fun. Well, I was there in spirit, if not in person, but sounds great. And then are you, will the second weekend basically be the same as the first weekend or is there different stuff involved? Like what's the, I don't know. It'll be the same. We're just repeating the exact same scenario. However, there are almost twice as many people. So we'll have to decide how many windows we're working on. And there may be some changes on the fly, but for the most part, we're replicating the curriculum for the second weekend. And the food, as far as I know, 
we could have the, the same food too. Sounds great. So I remember last year being like, what? People came from, we had Canadians, we had Texans, we had, what was the breakdown this year? Did you get a sense of where people came from? Well, guess what? We had Canadians and <gasps> we had Alabamans. We didn't have the Texas. Oh anyone from Texas this week. But we did have a couple from Alabama. We had, I think, Dayton, Ohio. We had Pennsylvania, uh, Detroit. Oh, how interesting. You know, we have all these old windows, but it's like nobody from here wants to go to this workshop. It's always people want to come from somewhere else. And yeah. I, I don't know if that's just because we advertise on Instagram and our followings are so broad or vast, or I don't know what you call it, what the word is for that. But I just find that interesting. Very cool. Okay, and I saw something on Instagram, but I forgot to ask Brad about it, and I don't think it was anywhere else. The, I guess the guy who did the last like full scale restoration of this building showed up. Oh, tell me, what was that? He did. It was very, very sweet. So the weekend of our workshop, it happened last year and it happened this year too. Falls on the weekend where they do a group memorial service. So basically oh. this is a summer cottage community and in the off season, people go live in different places. They go live right. in Florida or wherever it is they live during the, the cold months. And so sometimes, you know, they lose members of their group during those winter months. And so they have a memorial service for people who have, have died, you know, within the year. Right. From the previous summer. So they had a nice service again, and he happened to come because he's been a member of the community for a very long time. And his name is Roger, and he, I guess, was in charge of the, like you said, the most recent full scale renovation of Epworth, which was 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was just really into what we were doing with the windows and how we were doing it. He was saying, he said, Oh, we didn't even take them out last time, we just did them all in place. And I thought, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't surprised either, but I will say to work on those windows in place, they were probably yeah. 35 feet in the air if they were working from the outside. I don't yeah. know. They might've swiveled them in and it would have been a little bit lower, but it's, that would be a really tall ladder. Yeah. And I get just having worked on a few of them last year, I would imagine they basically did spot repairs and repainting. Yes, I think so. Because we had a mix of newer glazings and older. And so I guess it seems likely that this is the first time maybe ever that these windows have been like truly like stripped all the way back, properly repaired, all of that stuff. It is my understanding that some of the windows at that time, they determined them to be unsalvageable. And so they had them rebuilt in kind. Mm. Not a lot of them, but a handful of them on that side that we're working on this year were, were rebuilt. So it's it, that's interesting because it's time to do it again, of course. Right. And the glazing has outlived its life. And to work on those windows that don't have lead paint on them is really kind of wild because they oh, were yeah. built after lead paint. <laughs> that's right. How refreshing. It was a nice change, let me tell you. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm looking forward to weekend number two. And I guess next mini-sode, I'll tell you all about weekend two. And I can only cross my fingers and hope that it goes as smoothly as weekend number one. I'm sure it will. True Tales from Old Houses is supported by The Window Course. The Window Course, created by Scott Seidler of The Craftsman Blog, is a step-by-step, do-it-yourself program that will teach you everything you need to know to successfully restore your wood windows. It's self-paced, so you can go as slow or as fast as you need, and there are also several price points to fit your needs and budget. It is officially window season, so now is the perfect time to get ready to restore the windows at your house, and The Window Course has all the information that you need all in one place. Scott is offering his students a special deal. If you sign up for the Lifetime Access Package or Training Package, then you'll also get a free infrared paint remover, which is a $100 value. The window course comes with a money-back guarantee, and Scott is offering True Tales from Old Houses listeners a special discount. For 10% off, visit thewindowcourse.com and use the coupon code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Sutherland Wells. 
All of Sutherland Wells products are handcrafted in Providence, Rhode Island with the highest quality sustainably grown tongue oil. Tongue oil, which is native to China, has been used for centuries as a durable finish for wood, metal, and stone. Said it before, I'll say it again, unlike polyurethane, tongue oil finish actually penetrates the surface of the wood, so it flexes and contracts as the conditions change, which makes it the perfect pre-finish or protectant for everything from fine furniture to window sash and sills. You know, I'm a huge fan of the Clarabelle's Plus oil primer combination for window work. I also like the Slicky Wicky, Millie's, Murdoch's. I've tried so many of them. And whatever project you personally are working on, Sutherland Wells has an entire product line. This season, you might be working on siding, hardwood floors, furniture restoration, cutting boards, you name it. So to learn more about the complete product line, visit Sutherland Wells. That's W-E-L-L-E-S, SutherlandWells.com. And to save 10% on your first order, use the coupon code TRUETALES. During the last mini so Daniel, we actually, I think, dropped the name Lilydale, which you and I have talked about briefly in, a, I think, one of the ghost story episodes. But I guess you were there more recently. So let's I talk was. about Lilydale. Okay. So just to recap really fast, during the Second Great Awakening, tail end of the 1800s, there were a lot of these kind of religious like camp communities that popped up kind of all around the country, um, but a pretty high concentration, it seems like, in Western New York. Silver Lake Institute being one of them. Correct. So Silver Lake Institute, Methodist camp. There is also one that's pretty famous that's about, I guess it's like an hour and a half away, called Lilydale. And Lilydale is a spiritualist community. And so spiritualism, that Victorian era, like that's where Ouija boards came out of and seances and ectoplasm and all kinds of things that uh, have been variously debunked or not. So Lilydale is this little planned community as all houses from, I I don't know, the, the last half of the 19th century. And the really interesting thing about it is if you want to buy a house in Lilydale, I think this is still true. You have to pass three tests to like verify that you have some sort of clairvoyancy or mediumship or don't ask me the difference between the two. So essentially you have a community entirely filled with people with psychic abilities. Four years ago, I remember seeing a real estate listing for a house there and it was really cheap, like $65,000 or $70,000, which is incredibly inexpensive for the area. But it sat for a really long time and that's because not everybody has the gift. Right, right. (laughs) And do not ask me how this squares with federal fair housing law. But anyway, <laughs> um, I it's fascinating. So we went there and it's very much set up for visitors. So you actually pay a small admission. I think it was 10 or $15 to get in. And then they sort of have these like programs all day long. And so, or if you're, if you're a little more together, you can book like a hour session, I think, with any number of the mediums that, that are there. And a lot of them are residents. They also bring in like visiting mediums. So there was a woman there from, um, I think, Sorry. Switzerland. I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's okay. I think it's okay to laugh a little bit. I mean, okay. All it's right. fascinating. Just, you know, we yes. contain multitudes. So um, you were there, what, like a month ago, six weeks ago or something? It was fairly. It recent. was, yeah, like July 4th weekend or week, whatever that was. So we we did not book anything in advance. We just kind of came. And so there were two different, I don't really know what they call it, but basically picture, I don't know, 30 or so people in, in attendance and then a medium sort of standing at the front and saying things such as, oh, I, I'm seeing a elderly man, Joe, Jim, Joe, Joe, Jim. and then somebody, oh, my dad was Joe, and oh, okay, Joe, and and did he serve in the, in the army, and uh, well, the Navy, close enough, and you know, they kind of, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to make of it. It's basically like if you see the show Long Island Medium and Teresa Caputo with her big, enormous, amazing hair, and she oh, I just, have no idea what this show is, but I'm going to look it up. What? No. Okay, you're the second person I've talked to recently who's just never heard of Long Island Medium, which I find, how? 
She's a cultural icon. <laughs> I will look it up. I promise. We'll we'll bring that back someday, maybe. Let's okay. but go for it. Yes, you please. were there. So so we were sitting there in attendance and and the first I don't know session of this, various people got read. I was not one of them. Second session, I'm the first person they go to this one medium. I'm 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 drawn to you and I'm seeing. And so she said a lot of things to me that didn't make any sense and the stock response to that is oh well this will make sense to you late like later it's just gonna strike you that like all of that actually totally made sense um that hasn't exactly come to pass but we're only like three weeks out so you know yeah (laughs) there's still time time. there's still time (laughs) there's still time for me to remember my childhood best friend who died suddenly in a car accident that didn't happen Stacy none of that happened Uh, and she says that happened yeah okay so we're getting a really specific it was pretty specific yeah did you call out from the audience like oh yes I know someone no she just came to you yeah and I guess actually that's the way most of them were was basically them zeroing in on one person and saying you know I'm seeing this this energy around you or whatever. And right. and I think the different mediums sort of see, experience their mediumship differently. So some of them I think are, are seeing like a physical being. Some of them are feeling an energy. I don't, I don't know. That's so wild. <laughs> I'm not a medium, have... but uh, right. yeah. So she, she gave me a lot of information that didn't make a ton of sense. But then about 10 minutes before this started, I received the contract of sale for the cottage. Like, I finally have this document Ooh, that I've been okay. waiting for for two and a half weeks. And then, and I can't do anything with it because we're about to be in a, I don't know, a, a, a reading. What do I call it? You're doing as well as can be expected because I have no idea what you'd call it. Okay, great. Because I have no idea. Okay, so... I can't, I can't sign this contract because we're about to be in the reading. And so I set it aside. And then after the whole thing is over, I went up to the, the medium who spoke to me directly. And I just to say thank you. That was that was really interesting. And I don't know, I'm diplomatic, but it, it was. It was genuinely very cool to be like picked. And she goes, yeah, I just, I feel like you've just, maybe wrapped up a project or you're about to really start this really big new project maybe, um, which like, uh-huh. Interesting. It's quite true. And uh, and then she said, and I don't know what it is. I just see you surrounded by money. <laughs> oh. <laughs> which I was like, tell me more about that. Um, right. But it was this kind of like, okay, because – Interesting. I'm about to sign a contract for the largest sum of money I've certainly yes. ever seen. So, you know, you're not totally wrong. So she might have been real off base on the first part or not, or I just didn't get it. Later, it will all become clear and it you'll will. have this moment, right? That's what they said. So you just have to wait a little longer. Yeah. So I have a dead best friend that never existed, but I also... I'm surrounded by money and I'm going, the direct quote, I I will be successful beyond my wildest dreams. Oh, I like it. Watch out, world. Yes. Here (laughs) he comes. Yeah, it's a beautiful place to just kind of walk around. There's these little programs you can do. There's a couple little shops. There's a little cafe. So are the houses really cute, like the little Victorian cottages, sort of like they are at Silver Lake? If you had to describe them, what could we picture? I would say they're about the same, like, vintage as Silver Lake. I feel like many of them were a little bit, like, smaller and maybe even a little more ramshackly, <laughs> if you can imagine. Um, I was going to use the term vernacular, but yeah, ramshackly, okay. that works, yes. Much kinder than I tend to be. Um And then I noticed, I think there was a a higher concentration of more kind of like craftsman style houses. Oh, interesting. Like baby bungalows? Yeah. The houses are are so sweet and the residents are obviously interesting and fascinating and very like welcoming and excited for, you know, people to come in and experience their place. I liked it. I really liked it a lot. Andy and I went to Allegheny State Park 
a few weeks ago just for the day. And on the way back home, we passed the turnoff for Lilydale. I hadn't thought about Lilydale at all. And it was only one mile away. And I just, I knew I wasn't going to be able to convince Andy that we should go to Lilydale because we were on our way home. But at least I know where it is now because I really do want to take a trip there at some point. Yeah, it's totally fun. It's a sight to see. And you might just, you know, really learn something about yourself. Maybe they'll pick me. Yes. Maybe. I would love that. And maybe I would like to be surrounded by loads and loads of money. So wish me luck. <laughs> Best of luck. So you've done Lilydale. What is coming up on your agenda? I guess you've got to get this house sale behind you, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. So hopefully that is on the very soon end of the agenda. I'm going to Michigan to see some family. That's exciting. What a good time to go. I, I took a little time off, but I'm back on the horse of trying trying to price air conditioning. And I, it's feeling very unlikely. Overwhelmed. But, um, it's just so frustrating. But somebody connected me over Instagram to a contractor who's mainly an electrical contractor who they love, but they were like, he can do anything. He's the best, blah, blah, blah. So then this guy starts messaging me. He's so lovely. And I was like, what do you know about HVAC? And he was like, a lot, but I know an even better guy. So he got me in touch with this guy who I had a long phone call with. He asked that I send him a bunch of videos of the house to Help okay. explain. And I'm hoping I just, I'm just really hoping I didn't totally scare him off because the house, like, I've been emptying out the cottage. I've been selling all this stuff. My friend Juliet came and took more stuff down to the city. Like, it looks like a bomb went off. So the whole videos, I'm like, I swear it's not always like this. I would never <laughs> ask you to come work in conditions like this. So hopefully he watches them and doesn't block my number because uh, I sure <laughs> like him. And just kind of make a decision about it either way, because I really want to finish that closet in my dining room. But if we're running ducks in it, it doesn't make sense for it. So it's sort of like holding things up right now. I just want to get moving on some items. But if I'm putting duct work in, it won't make sense to move on those items. So anyway, I will keep you updated. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I have a little a new contractor project going on here at Blake Hill House, too. I oh. just just started it. It's on the sleeping porch. It's mainly just the rough in framing. Last year I'd kind of dismantled it because there was a ton of rot and I'd put in, yes, I'd put in some temporary solutions, but after the winter I realized, okay, this is not, this is not going to work. So I had my first meeting with this contractor who is really great. So he's a contractor that works here in town and does a lot of adaptive reuse on some of oh, these cool. old buildings because I'd met him and I'd seen some of his projects. I was really excited to talk to him. So to break it down, the sleeping porch, the pillars on the far corners are holding the porch up. The two pillars in the center are doing almost absolutely nothing. And the wall itself is collapsing away from the house. So he came to talk about how to shore that all up and I'll do all the finish work and put the windows back in. And I think it's going to be great. I don't know how much it's going to cost yet. I, I can tell you right now it's going to cost more than I want to pay. But it's yeah. also one of those things where... It's out of my abilities. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much that I couldn't do the work. It's just that I don't know how to properly secure the ceiling or, you know, the roof line. And that's really heavy. So for me, I feel like it's a safety hazard for me to take on that project. Yeah. Now, wasn't that roof reframed when you did your, when you replaced the roof? Didn't you mention that once? No. Oh. There was some reframing done, but it was underneath it. It came off Got of the it. corner of that. And it was on the lower roof. Got but it, yeah, this so I'm interested. I at least get to do the demo and sort of open it up and see see the damage. But I feel very comfortable working with this company and I feel comfortable that I'll be able to to say the things that are important to me and we'll be able to troubleshoot when things arise, which will. It's a can of worms. We're opening up a can of worms. It always is. But it sounds like you have the right mindset about it and the right people around you, which is more than I can say for myself about really anything. So. <laughs> you will get there. And I go through cycles too. Like I'm in a good cycle right now where the people that I'm finding are good people who know what they're doing, who I want to work with and who want to work with me, but it ebbs and flows. And it yeah. sounds like you're in a ebb and not a flow. <laughs> 
I feel like any time I'm trying to find a contractor to do anything, it's an ebb because it's never easy. Yeah. And I'm I'm also gearing up for a little bit of work back at the duplex, trying to intelligently invest in things that kind of need to be done. So I think the basement is where the next chunk of money is going over there, which is like so not fun, but I'm definitely hiring that one out because I am not trying to pour a concrete slab by myself. No more limitations, right? Yes. <laughs> so you'll hear all about it if the contractor ever gets back to me. Yes. <laughs> and once I know more about my project, I'll share the details too. But I think the timeline is more like September, or October. So I will get the bid back. And if I say this is what we want to do, we still have to wait to chat about it. But at least maybe it will be in the works. Sounds like fun. Sounds like a plan. Well, that's it. We've done it. Enough jibber jabber. All right. Thank you for listening to True Tales from Old Houses, the mini-sode. Until next time.